Today, from L.A., it's the Los Angeles Auto Show, America's most important show for green automotive technology. Well, heads will car. roll. Well, well, heads won't roll. GM will just disappear. They, yep. they won't get any money from anybody. They won't get a customer walking in the door. Okay. Now, if they do make it work, it is not an all-electric vehicle. It is an extended-range electric vehicle. There's a little gasoline engine in this. Is that the right strategy for EVs? Well, what the, the GM argument is that if you don't have a charging system built on board, the battery technology doesn't exist to give you the kind of range and performance you need without a charging Other system. Other manufacturers would say otherwise. Oh, absolutely. Nissan says that that's a waste of money. The, uh, Honda says that why would you put a gasoline engine and a gas tank on a car and add several hundred pounds of weight? Which, when you don't need it. What side do you bet on? Well, I'm betting on the... I, I think GM has got the right idea here. I think you do need a charging system. The second piece that's important is that when the gas motors or the diesel motors get outmoded, yeah. you can Out replace them with a fuel cell. You're right. Looking around here, Tony, I see electric vehicles, but yours is the only electric vehicle with a gas engine in it, too. Why? Quite, Quite a novel idea. Uh, the EV1 was our very first electric vehicle, and we, and we learned a lot. Yeah. Well, what we learned with those electric vehicles is that when the electricity ran out, when your battery was depleted, people did not like experiencing <laughs> range anxiety. So we fixed that with the Chevy Volt. We can continue to drive electrically, but we can extend your range by hundreds of miles. And Would that's you Chevy ever Volt take the gasoline engine out? Will battery technology get to the point where you have comfort that you're not going to get stuck in the woods? If the battery technology advances, we'll be ready. We will be ready for that kind of an initiative. If fuel cells come about and I can replace my engine generator with a fuel cell stack, replace the gas tank with hydrogen, we will be ready. If biofuels take off and my engine generator set will be a variety of different biofuels, we will be ready. That's the beauty of Chevy Volt. Give me a sense of how worried you are, Jim. I mean, you've bet everything on this car. Th this is it. If this doesn't work, Jim, will not work. What's it feel like? Well, you know, it's actually kind of exciting. You know, if I may say, it's kind of electric. Uh, <laughs> that uh, our team feels uh, like what we're doing matters for the company, for the country, for even more. And so, uh, you know, our sense of urgency hasn't changed. We're still so immediately focused on working on this car. We're getting a lot of people rooting for us. And frankly, there's a lot of people that are coming to the forefront, whether it's development of infrastructure, uh, software packages to help us solve some of our problems that are going to be part of Volt Team and part of the solution in the future. The automotive industry needs a home run. I think electric cars are that home run. Do you? I mean, how big could these be? I think displacing petroleum and electric drive is where it's at. And if you look, yeah. if you look at the history of electric cars, how they've struggled over time to make their way and, and be uh, the prevalent or mainstream drive system, now we have battery technology improving, and now we have some interesting capabilities in the grid interfacing it with the battery. The grid is everywhere, the grid is low cost, and the grid can be clean. I think the convergence of all those forces make this, make this inevitable. Make 10 percent of the fleet, 20 percent of the fleet, what could EV be? Well, you know, if I, if I was that smart, I wouldn't be here with you guys. You know that story. Uh, I do believe the future will be a blended future that uh, in, in our lifetimes we'll see all these technologies compete. We won't see one absolutely win, but by pursuing these and giving choice, choice innovation competition makes the best technologies, the best business ideas win, and I think the customers win in the end. As Cato mentioned, the Chevy Volt will use a lithium-ion battery to let you drive about 60 kilometers without even starting the gasoline engine. Lithium batteries, there, there must be 50 different kinds. Or more. Or more. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> you, absolutely. And they're used under and developed for different applications. Yeah. So you can have a very mild hybrid system and you'll use a certain lithium formation. You can use a have a strong hybrid and use something sure. the same or different and then... Behind us, all electric, have you settled on the battery you're going to put in the Volt? Uh, yes, we have, but we're not ready to announce it I yet. I see. That probably means it doesn't quite work yet. No, 
no. to the country. Oh. It's working very well. In fact, we've, we've run a number of different systems through our laboratory in Warren, our laboratories in Mainz, Castell, Germany, as well as our vehicle proving grounds mm -hmm. in Michigan, and they're working extremely well. Okay, I Both accept designs. that. I'm sure it does, and you don't have to name it, but what's the cost of these things? Expensive. If, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're very always, expensive. Yeah. New technology is always expensive, yeah. and especially as we move from the consumer electronics battery technology, and we've got to modify that in order to increase the life, increase the robustness, increase the quality uh, from consumer electronics to automotive grade. Right. And so the initial cost of these batteries will be expensive. But the goal is to learn, understand, optimize, get the volume up, yeah, yeah. get the cost down, get the quality up over time. How, how soon? Because in the meantime, that thing's just a science experiment. Not an exciting experiment at all. In fact, because I'm responsible for all the batteries that we worked on, nickel metal hydride as well as lithium, I'm able to capture and leverage the learnings from the nickel metal hydride control systems right here on the, mm, on the, on the vault. Right, the so system. the control systems, the thermal systems, we're we're using a lot of that from learn from from lessons learned over the last couple of years on the nickel metal hydride right here in the lithium ion. Denise, there is this well-publicized uh, battery recall. They catch fire in computers. How can you put them in cars? I will guarantee Gen General Motors will not put a battery in production that's not safe. You can think of a battery as another, the fifth person in our four-passenger vehicle. You've got to have a control system around it to make sure that you're reading all of the different sensors to make sure that the voltage and current and temperature is understood in a hierarchy of discussion on or decision-making on when you want to charge the battery, when you want a discharged battery, how you really want to operate that battery. We've got those systems in place to make sure that our batteries will be safe. How long do they last and what are you going to do with the old ones? The goal is to last the life of the car. That's our goal for this technology. 20 years? The life of the car is our goal. Um, but, but practically, um, the goal is eight to ten years in order to make sure that the life of the car is obtained. Um, that's still work that we're working through to make sure that our assumptions on life and our acceleration factors that we're applying today in our laboratory are accurate and we'll continue to learn from that. Again, because nickel metal hydride is a little bit different than lithium, but there still is some basic electrochemistry principles that we're learning and we're leveraging from what we get on the road today to be able to accelerate the various tests to get that uh, confidence that when we go to production that we'll be able to have the battery to live long. What happens after the, the life of the car, if you will? They go to the landfill, right? All the materials are recyclable. And who knows, there may be some secondary use of a battery. This battery for the, for the Chevy Volt in particular, 16 kilowatt hours, that's a lot of energy. The battery, you know, at the end of useful life is about eight kilowatt hours. So just think, I've got extra energy in this battery. Can't use it for this vehicle because it doesn't give me the range anymore. But maybe there's some supplementary, some secondary use for it. I'm hoping the industry is thinking about those things now. Britta, if we plug this Volt into some dirty old coal-fired electrical grid, are we really accomplishing anything? We, we absolutely, absolutely. Uh, take a look at the EPRI NRDC studies and many, many other studies around, even the oldest coal plants around. If you look at it well to wheels, the overall energy environmental cycle, fewer CO2 emissions than running on gasoline and producing and digging up oil out of the ground. Hmm. I would think the next step, though, would to make those energy, the electrical sources, as clean as possible, too. But is that a mandate of an automaker? Um, it, it's, it's not a mandate of an automaker, but it's already happening, is the bottom line. If you look at the um, energy new generation power sources that have been put online in the last three years, an overwhelming amount of the supply is coming from natural gas now and uh, renewables like, like wind. So it is already supplanting a lot of the coal that's already on the grid. And we're only at 49% coal. So, I mean, it's already happening that in the big, in the big aggregate, we're reducing the amount of coal in the grid. If there are enough electric vehicles out there, all these people are plugging them in, are they going to melt the grid? That's the other argument I've heard. The, the grid's not going to melt because we're too smart for that. There's something called smart charging, smart metering that's already being implemented by the utilities. And what that is, is it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's metering equipment that goes into the home. The most progressive utilities are already deploying that by 2012, 2013. A lot of that's going to be in existence at many homes. And these these, um, this piece of equipment allows consumers to better manage the loads in the home. It, it gives you incentives, for example, for charging or using appliances after 9 p.m. or 10 p.m. at night. So that smart metering slowly is being deployed in the United States, for example, and at other places around the world. We are going to just dovetail right into that scheme, and we'll be doing smart charging also in the future. Does it have to happen on day one? 
No, it doesn't have to happen. There's plenty of idle capacity on the grid for power. Not an issue. But do we want to move in that direction where, where consumers are more informed about when to charge and how much the load is and so on? You bet. You know, Cato, in spite of the fact the industry's in terrible shape, we saw some terrific new technology yeah, in there. Yeah, terrific and really expensive. Terrifically expensive. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's a billion for every one of these things we saw, oh, yeah. and they are out of money. Yeah, well, what, what this uh, technology change is going to require is billions from government aid. And, yep. and it doesn't necessarily need to be a handout, you know, in low-cost loans over long periods of time, and consumer subsidies so that people can afford to buy battery cars and hybrid cars. Well, you know, the next big auto show is Detroit and we'll see what kind of shape the industry's in then.